Lauren Healy is a nutritional therapist, co-founder of the Reset Retreat and an accountant. She specifically works with women who have endometriosis, having discovered herself that she had the condition a number of years ago. She now lives virtually symptom-free and wants to share what she has learned both inside and outside the classroom. Lauren believes all women who suffer from endometriosis can positively impact their symptoms by making some small impactful steps and is passionate about helping women do that. The route won't be the same for everyone, but with the right information and support, we all have the ability to help ourselves. Lauren spends her time working one-on-one with endometriosis clients, as well as organizing women's wellness retreats in Ireland and Portugal. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to um, come onto the podcast and speak about endometriosis, raise some awareness, um, and yes, yeah, speak about your journey. So thank you. No worries. I'm really delighted to join you today. So it's like your first um, podcast episode, right? Yes, first ever. Very exciting. I only started listening to podcasts a while ago as well, so I feel like I've come on a lot for <laughs> the of time. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, hopefully um, this will be like, your a uh, good episode um, for your for it to be your first one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So, can you first start by explaining what endometriosis is, and also share your, a little bit about your journey? Yeah. Um. So I suppose I'll tell you just a little bit about my journey first. Um. Mm-hmm. So I suppose I. Well, I've obviously had endometriosis for a really long time, but the thing is with endometriosis is that a lot of the time the symptoms that you have, you won't actually recognize it as being endometriosis. So um, about one in 10 women suffer from endometriosis worldwide, um, which is quite an astonishing figure. Mm. Um, on average, it takes nearly eight years for somebody to be diagnosed. So um, for me, I, I suppose I started my period very, well, I suppose, pretty young I was 12 so and that's kind of like research has shown now that you know uh, when the time that you start your periods the earlier you start your period um, it's a good kind of um, this good research really to show that you would potentially have endometriosis as well um, and it's, I always remember that I got my period quite young because myself and my sister are very close to me so she's like 11 months older than me and I remember she was absolutely devastated so I got my period before she did which is just very funny now when you think back on it, but um, I always remember my periods being very painful. But I think, and I think it's a message that we hear a lot now is that periods are meant to be painful. It's just something that you're meant to deal with. Um, and I always remember even I used to take a lot of a painkiller. It was called Femalax. You probably you probably remember it, but it was actually taken off the market mm. after that because it was such a strong painkiller. But I remember I used to have to take that quite a bit. And I also had like incredibly bad kind of IBS symptoms. So um, mostly kind of like diarrhea, bloating, and it just seemed to kind of get consistently worse the older that I got. Um, when I went to college, I remember it got very, very, very bad. But like, you're also talking about periods of time that are incredibly stressful. Like to start college is a really, really stressful time. When you're starting your first job, it's incredibly stressful as well. Um, but the IBS is like really, really bad. The IBS is so bad actually that like the period pains were kind of secondary. And I think a lot of them with endometriosis will find that. Um, and also just my immune system in general was really, really, really poor. So I used to just catch every single cold and virus going. I was constantly exhausted. I had um, really, really bad kind of sores around my mouth. Um, I remember I went to the doctor a good few times about that. Um, but I suppose I'd kind of gotten used to it as well. I suppose I kind of just thought, this is normal. I'll just always have IBS. I'll always have me for period. Like any doctor I'd been to, it wasn't really healthy because there wasn't anything specific. Like I remember once I went to the doctor and they gave me a prescription. I think I had six different medications on it. And I just was like, I don't want to take all this medication. I want an answer for what is wrong with me. Um, and one very, very, very worrying symptom that I'm yet to actually meet somebody else who has had this symptom was that I actually started to bleed from my belly button, and that sounds really, really, really gross. But I knew, I knew it had something to do with my period because it wasn't like um, it wasn't like blood, it wasn't like normal blood; it was like period blood. So I knew it had something to do with my period. 
But yet again, like when I went to the doctor, they weren't really able to give me an answer. They just said, kind of keep an eye on it. And it was only when I was 26, so um, I'm now, I'm 34 now, so it's only when I was 26 that I had a friend who was very, very, very ill at the time. Um, so I kind of become a lot more aware of my health. I think like you go through your 20s. I don't know, how old are you just going to my ask it? I'm 24. 24. I think like when you go to your 20s, like you kind of just think that your health is just a given and you don't really think anything about it. But because mm -hmm. my friend was very ill, I kind of started thinking I need to kind of take care of myself a little bit more. And around about the same time, I started needing to kind of go to the toilet a lot more. Um, and I used to drink a lot of water, so I kind of thought it might have to do with that. But I went to the doctor and basically, it was a, she was a really, really nice doctor actually. And um, she kind of had a feel around and she found something and she didn't seem to be too happy with it. So she scheduled me in for um, an ultrasound and I went for the ultrasound um, and they found something so they didn't really know. I remember they gave me the report. I remember I was on Google like a crazy person trying to figure it out. And they referred to me kind of on... Um, and they basically said they thought it was either a dermoid cyst, and I don't know if you've ever heard about a dermoid cyst. It's kind of, it's actually really gross. It's like a cyst, um, and they describe it, they say there could be a foreign material in it. So dermoid cysts sometimes have things like hair or like teeth in mm. them, or um, they thought it might be an endometrioma, which is kind of chocolate cyst, so like endometriosis. Um, so I basically, I, I got diagnosed with kind of endometriosis, endometriosis but the only definitive way they can kind of diagnose is by getting a laparoscopy so I ended up having a laparoscopy um, and they diagnosed it and I remember I came out of surgery and they just kind of said you have endometriosis you need to go on the pill go on the pill for a year and then just go on the pill as normal and that was really it I wasn't given a follow-up appointment I wasn't told anything about diet or lifestyle or nutrition or anything like that and I felt quite Helpless, like I was happy because it was a long journey, and I, at least I had a diagnosis. But I was quite uh, disappointed as well because I didn't really know what to do, and I kind of felt maybe had I done something to myself to, you know, result in this happening to me, or I didn't really understand this. And um, so that led me to, firstly, I suppose I went kind of the exercise route, so I kind of went to a PT. And I, I was working out a lot, but I was asking him a lot of questions about nutrition and he wasn't really able to help me or some of the answers he wasn't give, he was giving me were kind of a bit um, I suppose light on information. So I decided to go back and retrain as a nutritional therapist. Um, and that's pretty much what I what I do now. So I, I suppose endometriosis is kind of my area of interest because I feel it's the area that I can have the most impact. Mm, yeah, I agree. It's the same with me because I have I went through PCOS. I kind of wanted to just focus on that niche because you've been through it. You know how to, you know, you kind of know what to do and how people yeah. feel. So yeah, exactly. it's a bit easier to support people. But yeah, um, yeah. so yeah, that sounds like a really um, your journey is very emotional, very. Like, yeah. it just seems so, like, you just felt alone, like, with PCOS, you just want some help, but no one knows, and then you go to the doctor, and you finally get the diagnosis, but they don't actually help you in the sense of telling you the, right. the best approach. Yeah, they just give you the pill, like, take this, this is going to heal you, but in reality, yeah. it doesn't really, just makes matters worse, or, so, yeah, they don't know much about nutrition to provide you with the guidance. Um, no, I mean, yeah. like with PCOS and with endometriosis, it's not the case that you should be kind of going, I need to go the orthodox medicine approach and, you know, you ignore the functional medicine, the diet and lifestyle and stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it, you really need like an integrative approach to it. Mm -hmm. Like there's some women who really do need the pill to be able to control their endometriosis symptoms because they can't actually function properly. Like if they're in so much pain, that they do need some sort yeah. of contraception, like to actually manage their symptoms. But it really does need to be an approach that comes from every end, not just. Yeah. So, doing. so if you're on the pill, you should have the diet lifestyle approach. So you're not maybe on it for forever because we know yeah. it's not healthy to be on the pill. So have that integrative approach while on the birth control pill is than just being on the pill. Yeah, absolutely. 
So you basically discuss some of the symptoms you experience, but can you, what are the most common symptoms someone with endometriosis might be experiencing, but they don't know it's endometriosis, for example? Um, so I suppose the symptoms, that there's numerous, numerous symptoms, and they're very, very individual, as it is with a lot of like chronic mm -hmm. illness. Um, and I think it's a really, really important thing to say is that the severity of your symptoms doesn't necessarily correlate with the severity of your disease. So there might be some women and they literally may have very, very, very few endometriosis symptoms. And, but they might realize that they actually have very severe endometriosis when they, they maybe try, try to get pregnant or you know, trying to have a baby. And then they realize, you know, I actually have severe endometriosis mm -hmm. and I never knew. Um, and they usually they kind of categorize endometriosis by stage. So there's kind of four stages. So if you were to have a laparoscopy, they categorize it by stage. So stage one and two are kind of more mild, kind of minimal um, disease. So you'd have like small patches of endometriosis and you might have some scar tissue and say three stages three and four are more um severe and you might have you know the likes of cysts and stuff when you're talking about stage three or four but that doesn't correlate to your symptoms so like you might eat you might be virtually pain free and you might have stage four endometriosis so it's just an important thing to kind of note but some of the kind of more common um symptoms are things like so obviously painful periods are part of it but you know pain all, all month round as well not just necessarily just during your period and um, prolonged kind of periods so anything kind of longer than you know five seven days and very very heavy as well um fatigue like fatigue is a massive 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 thing that i do shows is because you know it's linked to endometriosis it's linked to inflammation inflammation is obviously going to affect your immune system and so fatigue and like picking up like every cold and virus under the sun is a big thing as well um other things um for like painful sex some, some women can kind of experience painful sex um and then um yeah like they're kind of like the main ones ibs of course sorry like ibs would have been a really 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 big thing for for me so is diarrhea cuts from some bloating um, and kind of sensitivities to certain foods um is a big thing as well Yes, yeah, so it's the same with um, pieces, like you might not have, like women don't experience the same symptoms, but it doesn't mean that you don't have PCOS because it's like different types of PCOS. So it's always, if you notice even some of the symptoms, you should go to the doctor, make sure and check just so yeah. you can start the process of treatment and healing. Yeah, exactly. um, so not that not that endometriosis or PCOS is better, but I mm. suppose that's the good thing with PCOS, at least you can kind of get a diagnosis like fairly easily. Yeah, I guess you just get the blood test, you check the whatever hormones and then you get the ultrasound and they say, oh, you have cysts. But even if you have cysts, it doesn't really matter. It's not, it's just, they call it PCOS, but it's not, it's not really attributed. The cysts don't really... I don't know why they call it pieces. Basic, it's basically yeah. an endocrine hormonal. It's only really one symptom of it. This is yeah. like you could have numerous other ones and, and not have cysts, but still have PCOS. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically just the hormonal condition. So basically, just look at the hormones rather than focusing on the cysts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it definitely. <laughs> um, so what? Oh, how does endometriosis? endometriosis uh, sorry <laughs> develops so what causes it um so there's no like definitive cause for endometriosis um there is thought to kind of be a genetic element to it but mm. it's, so there is some research out there that suggests there is kind of genetic element to that now like for me i know um i don't think anyone in my family has endometriosis now that's not to say that they don't have it, they could have it, but were perhaps never diagnosed with it. Um, but the kind of the main um, cause or thought cause of it is something called the retrograde menstruation. And basically what, so what endometriosis is, which I probably didn't cover very well so far, is that um, you have cells in your uterus, so you have cells in your womb, and they are cells that are specific to your womb. And endometriosis is when those cells in your womb grow in other places around your body. 
so not within the womb. And because those cells act exactly the same as the cells in your womb, they're under the influence of estrogen and progesterone, so they're going to grow exactly the same way as the cells within your womb do. So if you, obviously you've got normal hormonal fluctuations throughout the month, so your uterine lining is going to grow because it's supposed to be able to store a fertilized egg to be able to nourish it so it can be so it can become a baby at some point in the future and um, so the implants or the cells that are outside you just they grow as well and that's what causes kind of that pain and inflammation so with retrograde menstruation what happens is those cells that are in the uterus they flow back out of the uterus into the fallopian tubes and into kind of the abdomen area, which is normally where you find endometriosis. So basically it's like, they're just going the wrong way. The body gets uh, the wrong message to kind of send these cells the wrong way and they end up implanted in places that they're not supposed to. Um, which is kind of, I mean, it may, it, logically it does make sense that that could happen. Um, but it doesn't explain, so for example, there's some, there's, some people and they've been found with endometriosis in their brain or um in their fingernails so it does that doesn't explain that the one other theory is that endometriosis is carried by the lymphatic system and your lymphatic system is basically what like helps you get rid of waste from your body so that could potentially explain why endometriosis exists there's a, like there's a number of different theories but nothing mm. that's definitively kind of come out as a definite cause okay so yeah Definitely, they should do some more research to find out. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, so what? More research come out all the time. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, I mean, there will be kind of a definitive cause come up with. Hopefully, I just everyone just yeah. I get, get. I guess you just need to do the research. There's no clear, clear answers from many um, chronic illnesses or conditions. I mean, no yeah. one really knows yet because there's so many different stuff coming out. You just so. What are some of the dietary changes you have found through your journey and that you recommend to your clients? Um. So the first thing I'd say is like, I mean, and you probably see this with PCOS as well, is that like everyone is so completely different. Um, mm -hmm. and it's one of the reasons that I really get irritated when I see like the endometriosis diet because I'm just like it doesn't in my view it just doesn't exist like it's not a thing because like a, a normal kind of standard endometriosis diet is like get rid of wheat get rid of gluten get rid of dairy get rid of red meat eggs alcohol caffeine and I'm like there's nothing left to eat like there's literally nothing left to, to eat I just don't really understand it it's um so I suppose from my perspective, what I would always kind of emphasize over um, putting this in your diet is trying to add a lot more things to your diet in order to make it a lot more balanced to start off with. I think that's a much better port of call. It's like with women who have like hormone conditions, I know myself, I felt helpless. Like I felt like I didn't know what to do. And if somebody had come to me and they'd said, oh, well, cut all of these things out of your diet, I just would have felt a bit overwhelmed. I would have been like, this is just too much. I don't really know if I can take this on right now. So if somebody had said to me, well, why don't you actually try and add a lot more fruit, veg, whole grains, good quality, um, you know, just a good quality anti-inflammatory diet, that to me would seem a lot more doable. So I suppose like if I was to kind of like recommend three things that you can do like right now to be able to improve your diet the first thing i would say is just try and remove as much like processed food from your diet as possible so just try and make sure that you're eating you know as few things um that have any kind of packaging or labels in your diet as much as possible because we know that we we know endometriosis is an estrogen dominant condition so if we're eating processed foods, you know, they're obviously high high in calories um, mm -hmm. and fat cells themselves release estrogen. So we want to be trying to make sure that we're managing our weight as best as we can. That's just a big one. And the second one I'd say is like just try and include more fiber in your diet. So we, we know, you know, endometriosis is 
linked with inflammation and with inflammation we really need to be supporting the immune system so fiber is a great prebiotic and a pre prebiotics mean you know you're feeding your good bacteria and that's going to help support our immune system so that's a really really good thing to do and all the only thing you need to be doing for that is to be including a lot more fruit and vegetables in your diet it's a really really simple thing to do like there's a reason that people talk about the same things all the time it's because it works it's not mm -hmm. like people are just yammering on and telling people they need to eat more fruit, fruit and veg because it's, it's the fundamentals that really work yeah. and um the third thing I just say is like to include just you know really healthy good fats in our diet um, and mm -hmm. I've seen thing that I see especially with women who have like experience with like slimming worlds and weight watches and stuff like that that they just really are afraid of fats and it is getting a little bit better like in terms of people are starting to include more fats in their diet but I think even there's still a little bit of phobia around the amounts and you know they're kind of like oh, i'll eat a little bit of avocado and i'll be grand but like you, you really do need to be in tune yeah. healthy fats in your diet if you have any kind of hormonal condition because the building blocks of your hormone, hormones you can't do it otherwise so i think they're kind of like three really simple things that you can do for and that's not just for women who have endometriosis that's for women who have any sort of hormonal condition even the likes of pms you know so it's more about adding your diet rather than taking away. Mm. See, if I saw, if I heard or saw those tips while I was searching online for what I needed to do, that would have been so much more less scary because when yeah. I when I was searching, I was like, oh yeah, cut carbs, cut this, cut that. I was just like, I actually did that. I tried to do it, and now looking back, I was like, why the hell did I do that? I wish I just like added stuff instead of focusing on like restricting and removing stuff like yeah. yeah there's stuff that you know you should be removing like the processed and dairy because it's too much like the male hormones androgens it causes mm -hmm. inflammation but like if you just had those tips like eat more vegetables and just not focusing on all the other stuff it's just less daunting because yeah. a lot of people just like I did just cut everything out and they just stuck with I don't know what you stuck what you left with water yeah <laughs> just drink water food is scary yeah but it's it, really, um, I don't know because it's just I think people are sometimes they're looking for the magic pill and they mm -hmm. think that they need to make these massive 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 changes to actually really improve their health when really all it is is actually doing the really really small basic things consistently every single day and that's one thing that I would say like I mean for me with my endometriosis journey I know there's other people and they you know made radical changes to their diet overnight mm -hmm. and yeah. they've they've made changes to themselves and they feel a lot better but for me what's happened is that I've actually just improved my health every single day consistently and that's not to say that I don't fall off the wagon and you know have a few drinks or you know eat a McDonald's every once in a while that's part of normal life but it's more about giving yourself the tools the resources to know hey do I actually need to mind myself on a consistent basis to be able mm -hmm. to manage my symptoms and to be able to manage an illness yeah it has your, your lifestyle and diet have to be sustainable you have to be able to adhere to it in the long term because if you just completely from one day to the next just restrict everything it's it doesn't it's not easy it has to be like change consistently doing stuff over a period of time and knowing that if you do fall off the wagon have too much of bad foods you know how to get back to it and you know what how to hear your body and start yeah. you know eating the best foods it's it, once you make that switch it's your life becomes more simple and managing your condition seem is much more simpler yeah because you have a lot more control mm. you know what are triggers and what are going to make you feel worse and what's going to make you feel better yeah but yeah so yeah it's just sustainability and being consistent with your diet and healing will happen you just got to be patient at the end of the day yeah definitely um so we discussed some dietary changes. Um, do you recommend, or did you take any supplements? Um, 
So there's there's actually so many different supplements that you can take for endometriosis. Um, and I always think like supplements are a great way to get additional, you know, micronutrients into your diet, but they're definitely not, you know, a cure-all kind of thing. Like the fundamental thing you really need to be looking at is your diet. Um, and supplements are a great way in the short term, I think, to maybe bump up your diet. So for me, I you know, especially when, you know, my new uh, system was quite low, supplements were quite helpful for me because they just kind of helped uh, bump up kind of my micronutrients. So supplements are really, really, really individual as well. Like we're obviously all completely biochemically different. We're all going to, you know, need different varying amounts of certain micronutrients. So these are kind of very like general um, supplement suggestions that people could possibly take a look at. Um, magnesium is really amazing for women with endometriosis because magnesium is um, really, really great if you have, you know, cramps or pains. It's just going to help and um, soothe some of those cramps or pains. And obviously, it's really, really, really good for sleep as well. Mm -hmm. And if you're somebody and you're in, you know, a lot of pain, a lot of the time you really need to really make sure that you're getting really good sleep. So I am. Um, I'd always recommend the magnesium supplement and um, just to take for a bed. Um, a probiotic, obviously, so like if we're talking about immunity and inflammation, um, we need to really make sure that our immune system is as strong as possible. And there's so much research about um, gut bacteria and blood, gut bacteria and inflammation and how the immune system functions there. So a good gut bacteria or a good probiotic is really, really important. Um, and you don't always need to include a supplement. So you can include things like fermented foods. Mm -hmm. um, so the likes of kombucha. Kombucha is always a really, really, really good fermented food. I think if you're new to fermented foods, um, it can be really good because it tastes really nice. Like some fermented foods, you're kind of like, you're suggesting to somebody to eat sauerkraut and it's not going to happen like you know, it's not going to happen so for me to taste good as well so i think mm -hmm. it's really really good um and then obviously your um essential fatty acids so your omega three. if you're not a big fish eater like really you should be aiming to get like two or two three portions of fish in a week but if you're not a massive fish eater um a good omega-3 uh, fatty acid can be a really good addition to your diet, to the diet as well what about supplements and pizza is there any ones that you specifically kind of recommend? Um, I, I say magnesium as well, inositol, um, omega-3 and vitamin D, um, like a, maybe a vitamin B12, B6. But yeah, even in primrose oil is pretty good as well. <laughs> but not to like, just those are like the main ones because then you get more specific depending on the... The individual because like you said we're all different so those are just like the general ones that anyone can really take and you'll find some benefit from yeah um is there is there any lifestyle changes you um, recommend or you made so i don't know, I don't know yeah. more sleep more exercise any type of exercise stuff like yeah. that I would, I would actually probably say that the, like the lifestyle stuff is probably just as important as, as, as the diet stuff. Um, because I think when endometriosis, like one of the scariest things about it is that like you really don't have any idea of how your disease is progressing or if it's, you know, a little bit out, like in control at any mo moment in time because there's no real visible symptom of it. And usually, you know, it's only when you decide that you maybe want to start a family that you actually realize if you're going to be able to, if infertility is an issue and all those things. So it by itself is an incredibly stressful thing to have. And um, so like, like stress is such a massive, massive issue in modern day life anyway. But the thing especially to do with endometriosis is that, you know, if we're stressed, like we're obviously stress is there for a reason, it's there to make sure that we can function and we need a certain amount of stress. But if we're constantly stressed, our adrenal glands are really going to get exhausted. And then what happens is cortisol, which is the stress hormone, is going to compete with progesterone. We'll end up with low progesterone and then we're going to have higher estrogen. And that's how you can end up being estrogen dominant. It might not necessarily mean that you just have high levels of estrogen. And estrogen obviously is um, synonymous with endometriosis. So if you're estrogen dominant, there's a chance you have endometriosis. So 
like it's a, like people talk about stress and say stress it's really important to control your stress but it isn't like it is especially important to control your stress when it comes to endometriosis so um there's loads of different ways that you can do that and like when i work with people i always encourage them to come up with the way that they find the best way to deal with their stress because there's literally no point in me sitting in front of you and going you should meditate and like you know that person doesn't have five minutes in the day to brush their teeth like you know that's just another stressor to add to your life but it's incredibly incredibly important to actually take control of that and realize that a fundamental part of your healing and your ma and managing your endometriosis is actually managing your stress and um, so i always kind of encourage people just to come up with something that works for them and it doesn't need to be something that is relaxing to anybody else it just needs to be relaxing to you and it could be anything like i find it usually relaxing to sit down and pet my dog no like that to me is mindfulness you know and somebody else might might think that's completely you know to need ask but it works for me and that's that's just the way it is and mm. um, other things like that are incredibly important are of course like sleep so we really need to be looking at sleep. Like sleep is just hugely, hugely therapeutic. Um, and for me, like I know one really one thing that I always say to people is that you really need to understand how much sleep you need. Because we often live our lives based on other people's schedules. So like even like my husband, my husband only needs seven hours sleep. I need eight or eight and a half. And like I could I could wake up in the morning and he might wake up and I'll be like I could I could choose to go, oh God, I'm so lazy that I won't get up at the same time that he does. But it's not laziness, it's that I fundamentally understand as an individual how much sleep I need, not basing that on anybody else's schedule. I think is a really, really important thing. So the, yeah, yeah the two big things I would say are the stress management and sleep. Yeah, managing your stress is so important. I think in the world we live in we're always stressed because it's, we're just trying to do more. And then obviously we're trying to do more with not sleeping enough. And we're just this kind of snowballing effect where we're just not taking care of ourselves. Yeah. But with managing your stress, I totally agree. If you tell someone to just meditate, and just add in extra stuff that they just don't have time to do, or they might be like, I can't meditate. I don't know how to do it. So just find something that is relaxing to you and takes your mind off the stresses so for you it's like petting your dog or playing with your dog like for me it might be just watching something funny a comedy or reading my book just something that takes your mind off stuff and just like makes you it just brings you back to the present moment and not stressing about the future or the past and just being present um so yeah those two Mind things those two things are really 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 big so yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, everyone needs to just find um, ways that they can manage their stress and find the specific amount of hours because everyone has different set point hours that they feel more refreshed. Um, yeah. Once you know, for me, I don't know. I kind, I kind of fluctuate between how long I need to sleep. Okay. So like sometimes I can do with like five hours, but if I keep doing if I keep not getting enough sleep, after work kind of takes a toll on me and I'm like, oh crap, those those five, six hours of sleep have making me want to take three days of just sleeping for eight hours to recover. So yeah. I don't know, it's I don't know what I don't know what that happens, but I can do I can wake up early sometimes and sometimes I'm just like, no, I need this extra hour, I need an extra two. And then I just go back to it, but I don't know, it's weird. Are you, are you, you're probably under sleeping though then that you yeah yeah I prob, I prob, but i feel fine when i wake okay. up like i don't force myself i just wake up and i'm like okay cool I'm, okay I'm okay but then maybe doing it for too long yeah your body kind of needs a break i don't know yeah I, I guess it depends on the body how, how hard you're working how much you're eating you know all this stuff mm -hmm. but i guess we're all different you just got to find yeah. what's for you. Um, do you recommend or do you know any natural treatment ideas? That could um, so I haven't, I haven't had any experience with any kind of holistic kind of therapies. Like I know some people have said, that whether, like 
certain things work for them. So like acupuncture, I've heard is quite useful for endometriosis. But honestly, I don't have much experience with it myself. I've managed to actually alleviate mm-hmm. a lot of my symptoms just through kind of the likes of diet and lifestyle and supplements at certain points in time. So um, I don't know, it's not to say that I wouldn't look at it in the future. Um, I know there are lots of complementary therapies out there, but I just don't have much experience with them myself. I don't know, have you any with PFAS? Have you ever tried anything yourself? Um, no, I haven't. I've just gone through the lifestyle, diet, exercise, and yeah, that's it. I haven't haven't done anything. But I mean, I, w- I wouldn't mind giving something a go, but just haven't. <laughs> like you said, acupuncture is very popular. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know, maybe. Maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, so what piece of advice would you give our listeners suffering with endo endometriosis? Um, I suppose the biggest piece of advice I would give is to really, you need to kind of, I suppose, practice like a lot of compassion and kindness towards mm-hmm. yourself. I think like a lot of women I meet, I meet they, like they nearly feel that if they're partly responsible for what's happened to them and that can bring a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and especially when you're talking about fertility then as well that you know I think even the conversation around fertility needs to change in a way that I think women always feel that fertility is their responsibility and there's seldom a conversation had about you, you would never really catch like two men talking about the stage of their fertility whereas you know women you know talk about it a lot and um, so I think it's really to you know yeah just be kind to yourself and practice compassion and get in tune with your body and really understand on certain days maybe I don't feel as great maybe I'm tired today maybe I need to take it easy but also I would say and it's important to push yourself as well on the days that you do feel well on the days that you do feel that you can do a little bit more it's so you feel like you could do a little bit of exercise i'm not talking about going to the gym you know a massive one or anything but if you can go to the gym and do the yoga or you know do something a little bit fun or go out for a walk with your dog it's about pushing yourself on those days as well just because as i was saying it's kind of it's the cumulative effect of health the cumulative effect every day of feeling a little bit better so it's about pushing yourselves on the days that you can and the practice and self-care and kind of compassion on the days that you perhaps don't feel as well as you have done. Mm, yeah, that's good advice. I definitely agree that we have to be more compassionate towards ourselves because I feel like the there's no set time for you know how long someone could heal. It could take a year, it could take longer, it could take a couple of months. So you need to understand and you know be kind to yourself and know that it's you have to be patient and yeah. you will heal but just don't like rush the process because there's no quick fix there's no pill that's gonna help you you've got to be patient and consistent and whenever you feel like you have that energy to do a little bit more then go for it but if you feel like you're just forcing yourself and you're mentally not there you're physically not there just you know understand that it's okay and we all go through those days yeah. but yeah just some compassion self-care self some love yes yeah. <laughs> some love yeah absolutely. yeah just tuning in with yourself and- mm, yeah definitely um so how can our um listeners connect with you how can they find you um tell us about your coaching your yeah. um reset the reset oh, events yeah. that you have yeah everything <laughs> um so i go by the handle the nutritionist foodie so my website is www.thenutritionistfoodie.com and um, i work primarily with women who have endometriosis but i also work with women who have um other hormonal conditions Um i am um, yeah i also organized the reset retreat with um another um another girl who's a health blogger our next retreat is in Ireland. It's on the 12th to the 14th of October. There's still a couple of spots on it, and we have one in January as well. Um, and that's really like that encompasses, I suppose, a lot of what I was talking about today. So we look at kind of the overall spectrum of wellness. So we 
we look at yoga, Pilates, meditation, food, obviously. Um, and then we look at kind of more areas to do with like goal setting, how to have a better relationship with food, um, how to be more organized, less stressed, all those kind of things. Um, and I mainly use um, Instagram and Facebook. So as I said, my handle is The Nutrition Studio. So you can kind of put them Awesome. I'll have everything linked in the show notes and I highly recommend everyone check Lauren out. She's got some really good stuff on her Instagram. Very informative, very valuable information to help you all out. And thank you so much again for coming on the podcast and say, um, you know, helping spread awareness and your knowledge. And I really hope that this your first podcast was a good one. Yeah, it was. Thank you so much. It's been a great time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you again.